titles and intellectually recognized but of egocentric in that aspect of linear system. Okay, thank you very much for, for the invitation. And uh, I, I should tell you from the beginning that I am not at all a specialist in um, threefolds, but uh, I know that some of the interesting threefolds are constructed starting with uh, hypersurfaces or complete intersections with singularities in some uh, projective space or weighted projective spaces. Actually, 25 years ago, I was a visiting member at Max Planck Institute and among the other visiting members were uh, Fletcher, who was mentioned already, and he was computing his list of uh, threefolds at the time. And what I was doing at the time, I was uh, writing a book on the topology of hypersurfaces. Uh, the book uh, some of you know. And uh, so I continue to work on this subject. And uh, in this series of uh, lectures, I will tell you some of the old results and some of the newer results along this line. And uh, even I'm not a specialist in threefolds, I am hopeful that uh, discussing together, we may arrive at some uh, new ideas to develop the subject. Why not? The, the whole subject is about um, the interaction between topology and algebra. And uh, the simplest such interaction is uh, when you look at um, a smooth plane curve. Uh, this is defined by some, um, let's say, polynomial, which uh, I can take um, <coughs> So what is important, I will fix the degree. D is the degree of the homogeneous polynomial. And if you like uh, to have a precise example, uh, you can take uh, this polynomial, and uh, what is known is that um, the famous genus degree formula, which everybody know or should know, tells us that the genus has this beautiful expression in terms of the degree. So this means that if I draw a picture, if I am thinking uh, in terms of topology, I have a nice uh, a Riemann surface, which has a, a sphere with some handles. So here the number of handles is two. And by some uh, miracle, this topological invariant is expressed by this very simple formula. Right? So this is the simplest instance of this relation between topology and algebra. And then, of course, one knows that uh, such an equation is not important. We can change the coefficients as we like, as long as the curve stays uh, smooth. The topology does not change because they have Erasmus vibration theorem, and so the topology does not depend on the polynomial. Right? Very good. So, um, if I want to express this in terms of algebraic topology. Then I can look at um, homology or cohomology. So let's look at cohomology for some. So um, the space is connected. So uh, we know what is H0. Uh, we know H1. And we know H2. And that's it, because um, C, uh, as a manifold, as a real manifold, has a dimension 2, has a so complex dimension 1, equal uh, two real dimensions. 
And so we have a cohomology only up to degree 2, and the structure is very simple, right? Everybody knows this. And um, one can uh, do essentially the same uh, simple study for a smooth hypersurface. So by a smooth hypersurface, I mean um, the zero set of a homogeneous polynomial in uh, the complex <coughs> projective space, Pn. D will be the degree. <coughs> and then um, the analog uh, result of this is the following. The K cohomology of uh, V with Z coefficients is the same as the K cohomology of um, a hyperplane, and the hyperplane is just uh, <coughs> projective space of dimension one less. For all K different from the middle dimension, so in this case, we have this, uh, and this is OK, because we know that uh, projective line topologically is just S2, and then we have exactly what we need. And so, and here, we know that Hn minus uh, 1 of V, Z, this is free, a free Z module of some rank. And uh, I, I don't know uh, by heart the formula, but I know that people know a precise formula of the Euler characteristic in terms of a degree. And using this formula, which is available everywhere, in particular in my book, you can compute the rank of this group. Okay? And so I if uh, we have smooth hypersurfaces in a projective space, Everything goes uh, very well. And um, suppose you want more freedom, you want more space to construct interesting examples, maybe threefolds or anything you want. And then you, can, uh, you should pass from uh, the usual projective space to the weighted projective space. And you can consider similar notions which are called uh, quasi-smooth hypersurfaces, I guess. And uh, essentially, you have the same result as soon as you use Q coefficients. So maybe there are some nasty torsion uh, appearing, but if you are not interested in torsion, if you want only Betty numbers, so if you use Q coefficients for the cohomology, then exactly the same results hold, right? <coughs> and uh, moreover, All this extends to quasi-smooth complete intersections. So if you have a not just one equation, but several equations. And if they are transversal enough to get a smooth complete intersection in the classical case and um, quasi-smooth complete intersection in the weighted projective case, then uh, all these results extends to this uh, case. OK. 
Okay. Pardon? Yeah, supposing that I, I supposing that I remember this definition. <laughs> so my my definition is like that. Uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, you look. Um, this is defined by a weighted homogeneous polynomial, right? Should I define a weighted homogeneous polynomial? Just ask me everything you want, and I tell you if I know, right? <laughs> so. Uh, so it has a defining equation. I can look at this in the affine space. And if this defines an isolated singularity, then we say that the corresponding hypersurface is a quasi-smooth hypersurface. Now usually, the weights should be chosen in a normalized way. There are a couple of technical details, but this is the idea, right? Good. So, as soon as we have smooth objects, everything goes fine. And uh, maybe I will continue with smooth objects. <coughs> so, um, let's look at uh, this case. And let's look at um, middle cohomology with complex coefficients. <coughs> complex coefficients. And then, because we have a projective manifold, we have a Hodge decomposition, right? And now I will explain you, of course, um, it was known um, since a long time how to compute uh, the Hodge number. So for instance, if we come to this uh, very classical case, uh, H1C, C, this is just uh, has such a decomposition, and both of them are uh, g-dimensional. Right. <coughs> and so it was known um, since a long time ago um, how to compute the dimension of the species in terms of uh, n and of the degree. But it was, um, I guess, a surprise when um, Philip Gris Griffiths Uh, around this year, uh, last century, <coughs> explain that there is an easy algebraic way to describe these graded pieces. And now I will describe this, uh, this uh, approach to you. And I, I will use uh, this opportunity to introduce uh, the notation that I will use later. So um, S will be the graded polynomial ring in n plus 1 variable. Yes, <coughs> sir. Thank you very much. <coughs> so S is this uh, graded uh, polynomial in n plus 1 variable. And uh, F, and because it's a graded ring, uh, it has a decomposition. Uh, 
as a sum of homogeneous components. And if I take a homogeneous polynomial like that, I will denote um, by f uh, k the partial derivative of f with respect to x k for k equal to 0, 1, up to n. <coughs> and I will denote by gf the Jacobian ideal that is the ideal generated by all the partial derivatives. <coughs> Very good. <coughs> and uh, I will denote by m of f the quotient, the polynomial <coughs> ring divided by this uh, a homogeneous ideal, and uh, this is called the Milner algebra or Jacobian, and it is again a graded algebra. Okay, <coughs> and um, We can consider the Hilbert Poincare series as with any graded object. This is just a sum of the dimension as C vector spaces of the corresponding homogeneous components times <coughs> k. <coughs> And now, uh, what is interesting is that um, the assumption that we have a smooth hypersurface is equivalent to the fact that uh, the partial derivatives form a regular sequence in the polynomial ring. And uh, this is equivalent to the fact that the dimension, total dimension of uh, this uh, Milner algebra is finite. <coughs> so these are just uh, some definitions and uh, very simple remarks. And so now I will explain you uh, Griffith's remark in this setting, right? <coughs> So I can define um, a map from um, so I have an inclusion of V into the projective space Pn. And uh, when I pass to cohomology, I get uh, an induced map here. <coughs> and it can be shown that this is always uh, injective. And I will denote by Hn minus 1, 0, V, let's say, the co-kernel of I star, which is a primitive cohomology, if you like, of Yes. The double implication, when you say, mm -hmm. that is the dimension of the middle answer of the middle answer by the less than infinity. Yes. So, first of all, 
Is this uh, clear? Not really. Should I explain everything? I will explain everything. So this is most, as we have seen already, uh, because if I look at this in Cn plus 1, this means that this is an isolated singularity. What does it mean, isolated singularity? It means that if I look in Cn plus 1, the zero set of this condition is reduced to the origin. Right? <laughs> and now there is a theorem telling me that the dimension of uh, such a sequence of the zero set is exactly the number, the, if the co-dimension is exactly the number of elements, then is, um, okay, and the other equivalence is just uh, Hill Bernus telling that? Yeah, yeah. No, it's very good to ask questions. Question, yeah, yeah. Sometimes we believe life is more complicated, but in fact, life is simpler. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, so now the really the really deep result is this theorem due to Griffiths. It has two parts. The first part says um, that if I look at the Gizin sequence, and I'll write for you what I mean by the Gizin sequence. So I have, uh, first of all, um, <coughs> so I will put u to be the complement, so Pn minus v. And uh, the first, um, so j is the inclusion. And uh, the first uh, type of morphisms occurring in the Gizin sequence is just this morphism induced by the inclusion. And in terms of differential forms, is just the restriction of differential forms. And then we have a, a morphism R. And then we have a morphism delta. And then this uh, continues. And the claim is that in this Gizin sequence, <coughs> uh, the induced mapping. You did in G, sorry, or another? Uh, Thank you. <coughs> uh, so it's better to say from the Gizin sequence, we get an isomorphism. And um, <coughs> I will explain you a little bit later what is this morphism. This is a Leray residue. Uh, 
polymorphism. I explain in a second what it is in geometric terms. But the idea is that we can relate uh, the interesting uh, middle cohomology to the cohomology of the complement. And for the moment, this is not very interesting because both objects are smooth. But in the future, V will become singular. And then if we are able to relate something singular to something smooth, this will be quite useful. OK. Pardon? Zero. Yes. Primitive. Zero is primitive. Yes, exactly. So I explain uh, the definition here. <coughs> and OK, this is the first result. And then the second part, which is I have a natural identif identification. between two very different objects. I take the minor algebra, and I take some com homogeneous components, kd minus n minus 1. And I take here h0 n minus k, k minus 1 of d. And I claim that these two quite different objects can be identified. Now, how does it look an element here? Well, an element here can be represented by a, monom by a monomial. So I can always represent any class here by a monomial. So x alpha is just x0 alpha 0 plus xn alpha n with um, sum of alpha j equal to this funny number. <coughs> and now, to such a monomial, I have to associate a cohomology class here. And to do this, I use this uh, isomorphism here, R. And so it's enough to construct a cohomology class on the complement, U. And on the complement, I have some nice cohomology classes. And I will explain what does it mean. Omega. is um, the Euler contraction of uh, this product. And if you don't know what is the Euler contraction, I can write a formula. I will uh, change it. <coughs> so you can.
Okay, so now I will write everything down in very explicit uh, terms for our plane curve case. So uh, what happens when uh, n is equal to 2, then I will use as indeterminates x, y, z. <coughs> and uh, let's take a special case, d equals 3. And uh, if I take this favorite polynomial, Uh, then the Milner algebra is just a polynomial algebra divided by the idea spanned by uh, this uh, partial derivative, essentially. And so you see that as a vector space, As a vector space, it has these bases. Very well. <coughs> and so, <coughs> uh, in uh, this theorem, uh, the first value of k I can take to get something non trivial is k equal to 1. So if I take k equal to 1, I get a my isomorphism between N MF0 and H2 <coughs> minus 1 is 1, 1, 0 of our plane curve, see? And here is not necessary to add 0 because um, when the total degree is odd, then primitive cohomology coincides with cohomology. <coughs> and so here, I have just uh, one dimensional vector space, so one is a basis. And uh, here I have to take the residue of um, this differential form. And you have seen this differential form if you <coughs> have done some. Uh, Differential geometry, because it's a differential form uh, defining the top cohomology of the usual two-dimensional sphere in the usual three-dimensional space. Uh, anyway, in our case, this is uh, the correspondence. And you see that <coughs> we get the fact that um, uh, now I recall you that uh, this uh, residue, if I have a, a form of this type, where alpha, is alpha and beta holomorphic. So this is a local computation. So locally, if I have a differential form having a pole of order 1, and if this is a, a formula for the form, then the residue is just the restriction of B to, to V. And you see that here, uh, essentially, <coughs> What I get, I get um, we know that this is C, and uh, this is spanned by a constant differential form. And this is exactly that constant differential form on the <coughs> This is an elliptic curve, and so this is uh, identification in this case. And we have another piece, which comes from the from the k equal two case, and this is m three zero uh, one. And here we have this uh, monomial, and this comes to the residue is mapped to the residue of x y z the same form here. And here we have a pole of order 2. <coughs> and so uh, when we have poles of order 2, such a simple local computations no longer work. And this is normal because uh, here the um, forms 
are um, we we cannot represent uh, uh, the elements here by holomorphic one forms. We have to use a complex conjugate of one forms. Okay, so I hope uh, this uh, theorem is now uh, clear, and we can uh, continue to to see what can be done. Um, in, um, in general. <coughs> okay. So now um, assume that we are interested in a, a singular hypersurfaces. Now after the smooth hypersurfaces, the simplest hypersurfaces to consider are the hypersurfaces having only isolated singularities. Right? So I will assume now that V has only isolated singularities. And I will draw this. Uh, in this way, and I will assume that there are singularities at some point. So now I, I will uh, work all the time in the usual projective space, straight. And um, Griffith theorem generalizes without any problem to weighted projective spaces. This is well known. And it generalizes, and maybe this is less known, to smooth complete intersections. There are nice descriptions of cohomology using differential forms. And uh, in my series of lectures, I will explain to you to what extent this generalizes when we have singular hypersurfaces, right? And what do I mean by, by a hypersurface with isolated singularities? I mean that, for instance, if I choose uh, some local coordinate around the point, so I choose uh, mu1, mu n local coordinates, at uh, A1, and then uh, the germ VA1 has an equation, G of U equals 0, such that uh, the set of partial derivatives The germ of this coincides to A1 as germs at uh, A1. <coughs> and for instance, what does it mean that I have, a, as an example, uh, set theoretic, exactly, as set ger germs of set, yes. For example, what I say when I, uh, what, what I mean when I say that V is a nodal hypersurface, this means that I can choose this equation to be the simplest uh, singularity, an ordinary double point. That is, the equation is just a sum of squares in some, in some coordinate, in some local coordinate. Uh, the equation is given by sum of squares, right? And what do I mean if I like to say that C inside P2 has a cusp at the point A1? This means that I can find some local coordinates U and V such that the equation is the equation of a cusp, right? <coughs> Okay, and so assuming we have such a hypersurface 
having only isolated singularities, we can ask again how how does um, <coughs> the cohomology of such an object compare to the cohomology of a hyperplane? And we have a simple result. From the cohomology, with integer coefficients is the same as the cohomology with integer coefficients of a hyperplane for all um, k different from the middle dimension and the middle dimension plus one. So if we forget two dimensions, then everything is as simple as for a, for a hyperplane. So this is the first observation. And the second k observation. For all k different from Thank you very much. You know, I make such small mistakes because I like to check if everybody is awake, <laughs> especially now. <laughs> <laughs> That's already a good point. <laughs> In some lectures, <laughs> it's difficult to find even that. <laughs> OK, and so we see that we have just two dimensions to, to worry about. And moreover, we have a very simple formula for the Euler characteristic. So this is the Euler characteristic of a small deformation, V0. And I will draw V0 with a red chalk. So V0 should be sort of something like that. This is V0. And this is V. And you see there's a difference in topology between V and V0 is just inside the these small balls around the singularities. And inside the ball here, V has uh, the singularity. And this singularity is a cone over the link. And so it's a contractible space. And uh, V0 has exactly what is called the local Milner fiber. So this is called the local. fiber, and uh, it is known that such local Milner fibers have a homotopy type of a bouquet of spheres of dimension n minus 1. And the number of sphere here is exactly the Milner number of v at this point. So at each point, we have a number, which is called the Milner number. And this number is a number of spheres we have to put together to get the local Milner fiber. And uh, now you have seen from the first part that this part is known. And there is a correction term, plus minus 1 some uh, exponent, which we'll check in a second. And here you have to add all this Milner And to get the sign, so in the case of plane curves, n is equal to 2. And uh, what do you want? <coughs> uh, this can be quite negative. And we can, we can, OK, this is OK like that. It's minus 1 power n. <coughs> and <coughs> So as an example, uh, assume that we have a, a caspidal uh, cubic plane. Uh, this means that um, high of v is high of the smooth nearby deformation. 
this will be a, an elliptic curve, and all the characteristic of an elliptic curve is zero, plus, because of minus one power n, we have to add the minimum number of a cusp, and the minimum number of a cusp is two. And uh, we get two, and this is okay, because v is uh, homeomorphic to a rational curve. T1, which is just a topological two sphere. Okay, and so that you see that in general, we have two unknown. Uh, if we forget about torsion, we have just two unknown Betty numbers, and we have a simple relation among them. So if we determine one of them, we know everything concerning the Betty numbers. Okay, now the story, the story uh, becomes to get a little bit more complicated because uh, people realized very soon that if we look at um, hypersurfaces with isolated singularities, uh, one cannot decide everything just by doing local computation. And this was realized by Zariski. And uh, this was something like uh, around the years 29-30, in the century before us, <coughs> in the previous century. And he realized that there are uh, 60 curves with um, six cusps. of two different types. In one situation, the cusps are situated on a conic. And in the other situation, the cusps are not on a conic. There is no conic passing through the six points. So I will draw five of them on a conic, because I think that through five points, we always find the conic, and the other one is somewhere here. And uh, using the notation I introduced in the theorem, uh, what is the difference? The difference is that in this case, the fundamental group is a complicated group. is highly non-commutative. This is a free product of two thickly group of this type. While here, the fundamental group is a billion. OK. And uh, one can say, maybe we are lucky. Maybe the fundamental group is some nasty beast because it's non-commutative. But we are interested in cohomology. Cohomology maybe has a simpler behavior. Maybe we can avoid such phenomena. But the truth is, we cannot. And the simple explanation is that if you take f of x, y, z equal to 0 to be the equations of such plane curves, it is enough to consider surfaces with uh, such an equation. And then uh, the difference between the fundamental groups here will appear as, dif as differences between the Betty numbers of these singular surfaces. So what you have seen here is the difference. So assume we have uh, two such uh, the difference here will be translated as differences between B3.
one of them is uh, zero and one of them is two, if I'm not wrong. And so the conclusion is, uh, we would like to do topology because topology is very simple. We can deform objects and uh, do local computations. And uh, the answer is we, we are not able to do this because uh, if we use only topology, it is very dif difficult to express the difference between these two situations. This is really an algebraic differences and we have to use algebraic geometry. Okay. Any questions? So, so I, I, I'm not sure, for example, what you've been doing is quite a, a, a corpus uh, to have early nodes. Yes. I don't think you can make them collinear. It's fixed, then it's flipped. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are two completely different topologies. I understand, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Locally, I would have to go back. Yes, if you allow curves which are not irreducible. Yes. The so, I mean, your formula there for the boilers. Yes. If you know if I'm making a five, so it's nil to five. Yes. Yes. So you get the definite result. Mm -hmm. The problem is you need a dependence. Yes. So that, that's why there's a, a quite an ambiguity. Yes. 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 It's, it's already there for the generation of the corpus. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. You're right. You're perfectly right. <coughs> exactly. 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 Defect, exactly, exactly, exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> introduce this at some point, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now this is uh, somehow the general introduction. What are we going to, to do? So because of this uh, text, we need to use some uh, heavy, heavier machinery in order to compute these uh, Betty numbers. And now, um, I would like to ask you if you are familiar a little bit with mixed Hodge structures. Uh, we need just a definition. What is a mixed Hodge structure? The fact that there are two filtrations, the weight and especially the Hodge filtration. So what do you think? Is it good to recall this or we just? I think just for the general audience, uh, it's better to recall it. Okay, very good. Because this will uh, then uh, conclude the uh, the stuff today.
So a pure hot structure <coughs> of weight m is essentially what uh, you know already, but uh, can be formalized as follows with a pair HF where H is a finite dimensional Q vector space. <coughs> and uh, F is a decreasing filtration. on H of the complexification of H. OK. <coughs> uh, such that if we set uh, HPQ to be FP, FQ <coughs> conjugate, then uh, HEC is just a direct sum of P plus Q equal to M <coughs> HPQ. <coughs> OK. And um, so this is a usual decomposition uh, you learn in whole theory. And you ha if you have this decomposition, then you define uh, Fp to be just a direct sum of H A B for A big or equal to, to P. <coughs> and so uh, decreasing meaning that you have this, and this is H C. And at some point here, you will get zero. And uh, now, what is um, <coughs> a mixer structure? Is a triple H W F, where H. H uh, and F are as before. Mm, no, H is, so <coughs> is a finite dimensional Q vector space. Uh, F is a decreasing filtration on the complexification. <coughs> w is uh, an increasing filtration. on uh, H, <coughs> such that so the compatibility between the two is the following. If we consider the K graded piece with respect to the wave filtration, which means uh, WK divided by WP K plus 1. Uh, <coughs> has an induced pure host structure of weight K by the filtration. So the filtration F induces filtration on each of these uh, graded pieces. And uh, on each graded piece, we have the properties which is uh, taken here as a definition. And I will explain you on uh, this example here. So. Uh, 
So we have seen that this is an isomorphism. And we know that here we have a pure, um, a pure host structure of weight uh, n minus 1. This is classical host theory. Now, uh, Pierre Delin has shown that the cohomology of any algebraic variety has a Miss Hodge structure, right? And this Miss Hodge structure has some special properties. For instance, here, because u is smooth, we know that uh, all the weights should be big or equal to n. That is, all the wk for k strictly smaller than n should be 0. And we have here an isomorphism, which is of type minus 1, minus 1, in the sense that the piece H PQ here correspond exactly to the piece P minus 1, Q minus 1 on this side. And so, because here we have something of weight N minus 1, the weight here is actually N plus 1. So you see for uh, varieties which are not projective, we can have weights which are strictly bigger than the degree of the cohomology group. And so, uh, no, in this case, it's just weight n plus 1, because you know that this is an isomorphism. Uh, there is no, no other stuff. There is no other stuff, because we have hn pn going to hn uh, u by the inclusion, right? And uh, the, the weight n part normally comes from such a compactification. But this morphism is trivial. One can show that this is a trivial morphism. OK, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. general construction, and then there are um, special properties if we assume that the variety is complete, but singular, the weights in each degree are lower than the degree. On the other side, if it's smooth, the weights are bigger. So it's, if it is projective and smooth, <laughs> this coincides, the weights coincide with the degree. This is one example, but there are several statements of this type in the general theory. Thank you. Stop this. Uh, <laughs>